Well, thank you everyone for joining us today in the latest in the Insight series online. And today we're joined by Joseph White, our Director of Design Strategy. Over the last couple of years, we've hosted over 100 webinars with a wide variety of speakers, a diverse range of subjects, and many of those have included Herman Miller insights uh, being shared by some of my great colleagues. But we haven't talked much about Miller Knoll. Well, today we're going to put that right. And we want to talk about the coming together of these two great organizations. I want to share with you a little bit about our journey, where we've been, and especially where we are going and how together we can help you design for the good of human kind. So Joe, we're going to hand over to Joseph, who's going to share our aspiration for redefining modern for the 21st century and the four key design principles that he's going to share with us. We will be using the chat box quite regularly, so please feel free to put your questions there and make sure they're sent to everyone. Joseph, over to you. Thank you very much for giving us your time. Thank you, Mark, and thank you to all of you on the line for giving us some of your time. Really appreciate you um, connecting today. So here's the agenda for our time together, um, breaking this down into three sections. Our world in flux, uh, gonna review some current issues facing the world and new expectations um, that we're seeing arise from people. Um, under the force for good section, we're gonna talk about the merging of the strengths of Herman Miller and Knoll and how we will use those, that strength to help create places that matter uh, in the final section. So let's take a look at some of the issues and expectations that are shaping the current context. So our world is in flux. Issues of social inequity, the climate crisis, the pandemic, and broken supply chains are impacting everyone. While some of the aspects of modern life have changed forever, others are anything but subtle. This moment presents a rare opportunity to learn from our lived experiences and merge our strengths. We believe that design is the way we will come together to build a brighter tomorrow. And together we have the responsibility and the power to help people design places that matter. This graphic comes from the World Uncertainty Index. It's a new report that synthesizes the frequency of the word uncertainty or related variants um, in the reports on 143 individual countries on a quarterly basis by the Economist Intelligence Unit. So those that went through some of these events that you can see on the screen, have we, we've got our own stories to tell around how these events impacted our own lives, as well as the companies we've worked for. And over time, we can see that the uncertainty is increasing. It's becoming more erratic and interconnected globally. This reinforces the need for more flexible solutions and decentralized decision-making so that people can respond in the moment in relation to the conditions in their immediate context. So take a moment and think about the structural systems in modern super tall towers. Those buildings are designed for movement to withstand seismic activity and extreme wind force at such great heights. In the world's tallest building, the Burj, Burj Khalifa in Dubai, um, it's reported to sway about two meters at the very top. So in this case, its flexibility is key to its strength. And the same premise applies to modern place design as well. Amidst all the uncertainty we face, some big changes that have been brought on by the pandemic are showing widespread stability. And a recent study of working from home found it to be a globally established phenomenon. And even though many organizations are still working through their, their go forward plans for supporting work from home or not, um, there are numerous studies that report similar results. This study found that employees desire about two work from home days while their employees employers are planning for just one work from home day. But perceptions about working from home have improved across all the countries that you see listed here on the screen and productivity has also come in higher than um, than expected and we're seeing um, greater working efficiency um, in many cases than when working in traditionally planned offices. So another thing that was interesting here is that um, the respondees to the survey indicated that they would value having the opportunity to work from home two to three days a week as much as they would value a 5% raise in pay. Um, so these are some pretty interesting stats. And here's another. Um, we know that hybrid still has an uncertain future, 
and that people and organization leaders are embracing it very differently. Uh, that's definitely brought uncertainty to our, our working conditions. But according to a recent survey by Future Forum, a majority of global knowledge workers are now working in hybrid arrangements. Future Forum, by the way, is a multidisciplinary consortium focused on building a new way of working that's flexible, inclusive, and connected. Miller Knoll is a founding partner of that group, along with Slack, Boston Consulting Group, and Management Leadership for Tomorrow. We work together with those partners to conduct research and convene executives to draw from their real experience in designing new people-centered approaches to the future of work. The Future Forum Pulse is a survey that's administered quarterly to over 10,500 workers and executives across six countries. And those include Japan, France, Germany, Australia, the UK, and the United States. The, last, the latest Pulse report actually just launched yesterday on the 19th and it highlights some pretty stark figures on the difference between the experience of workers and the expectations of leaders. But that's a topic for a different conversation entirely. Um, we'll be sure to follow up with a link directly to that report so that you can check that out once we're done with this uh, presentation today. Another key statistic that we're seeing from Future Forum is that knowledge workers have significant expectations for flexibility, both in where they work and even more significantly in when. Interestingly, another unrelated study focused on working from home. Um, in that study, researchers found that workers often shifted their workload allocated um, from their allocated work from home days to nights and weekends to take advantage of the daylight hours during the week for other activities. That same study found no impact on performance or promotions and actually saw a 35% reduction in quit rates and a 12% reduction in taken sick leave. This is a, a level of freedom that people have uh, begun to enjoy and aren't easily going to let go. So in this context, the integration of Herman Miller and Knoll comes at a really opportune time. We're actively working to merge and amplify the place design expertise of Herman Miller and Knoll. And today I'm sharing some of that early work as it develops. We're building on the legacies of the Knoll Planning Unit founded by Florence Knoll in 1943 and the Herman Miller Research Corporation founded by Robert Probst in 1960. The Knoll Planning Unit was a catalyst for the burgeoning commercial interior design industry in the US, helping to create offices for some of America's largest corporations, including IBM, General Motors, and CBS. The Herman Miller Research Corporation led by Probst was responsible for the publication of the book, The Office, a facility based on change. A key insight he revealed in that document was that the real office consumer is the mind. The subject starts there, and more than anything else, we're dealing with a mind-oriented living space. This, was, this is what led to Action Office, a revolutionary product meant to liberate the desk-bound knowledge worker, and it also launched facilities management as a new dedicated profession. The merging of these two perspectives can be illustrated by complementary sound waves. When two identical waves join, they produce one with the same wavelength, but twice the amplitude. Knoll approaches planning from the holistic perspective of the place, scaling down to the person, and Herman Miller approaches placemaking by starting with the person and scaling up to the holistic vision of place. In our unified approach to place design as Miller Knoll, both directions are present. They are, after all, on the same spectrum and ultimately focus on the experience of people. With such a strong focus on the relationship between human behavior and the built environment, our foundation of knowledge can help create places beyond the office. And this is especially important today as people seek to achieve new levels of agility in navigating the demands of life and work. To support that need, our new Miller Knoll research agenda is anchored by primary studies designed to identify the drivers of change impacting people's experiences and how those changes will impact the design of places. For example, we're currently wrapping up a foundational study on the evolution of home life over the past two years. That project has taken us into approximately 100 households in seven countries around the globe, including Germany, Brazil, Mexico, Japan, Hong Kong, the UK, and the United States. Our primary research perspective is supplemented by a range of secondary research initiatives with experts in fields such as environmental psychology, sociology, and neuroscience, 
as well as strategic partnerships like the one I mentioned a little while ago with Future Forum. So now here we are to the, the bulk of the presentation. And one thing that I wanna make really clear is that the value of working with qualified design professionals cannot be overestimated. When we talk about our approach to place design as Miller Knoll, we aren't talking about the professional practice of interior design or architecture, but we are talking about the important role that we play in the bigger picture of creating great places. It's true that we love seeing our products in beautiful places, but our role is bigger than that. We are stewards of the knowledge, expertise, excuse me, <clears throat> of the knowledge, experience, and humanity that made our legacy brands into icons of design. We have the power and responsibility to spark positive change and make a true difference and design a more beautiful world. Helping people create places that matter is one of the main ways we can meet that aspiration. So we're here to make our expertise as well as the products and solutions that arise from it available to you as resources to help create the places that you envision. So by now, leading organizations are well aware of activity-based work as a planning approach. But good design is not a zero-sum game, and that includes planning paradigms. Perimeter offices along the window line, open office benching applications, and even more cellular workstation applications, none of these approaches to planning are inherently wrong. Success or failure all comes down to the intention behind an application and its alignment with the people it's designed to support. The problem lies in generic planning applied in broad strokes. People rarely benefit from prescriptive approaches to design. Generally, it's understood that we must first consider specific people and their aspirations in order to create an appropriate place. But from there, the process can diverge widely, and that's a good thing. Diversity and perspective and, and approach are core components of creativity and innovation. So we've synthesized the expertise of Herman Miller and Knoll, along with our forward-looking research agenda, into a new set of guiding principles for place design. The way we talk about these principles and the language we use will evolve over time, but the spirit of each is strong and will be with us for the years to come. Each principle first speaks broadly to an area of concern in the place design process and then progresses with increasingly targeted insight. The considerations are modular and non-linear, allowing each principle to be addressed in a way that respects people's specific needs, interests, and resources. Collectively, we view them as our place design toolkit, offering freedom within a framework for creating places that matter. So let's take a look. While much of the research and practice that inform these principles origi originated from the realm of workplace, the core mechanics and emotions that connect people to place are universal, regardless of place type. Not only do these principles organize insight gained over decades, but they also guide exploration for uncovering new insight well into the future. The series of slides that follow have a consistent format. So first, I'm gonna review um, broadly each principle and then we'll take a look at some examples of related knowledge categories contained within each. And finally, I'll highlight specific resources that are available to you now, and we'll follow up with links um, to these resources after the presentation. Let's take a closer look at the first principle. Places that matter start with people. Understanding how people experience the world is a prerequisite to creating places that matter. The value of a place is conferred by people based on how it makes them feel. Our lived experiences shape our unique perceptions of value, and that perspective is what gives a place its meaning. While it's true that feelings are subjective, they are ultimately explicable and can be known. So in other words, we feel before we think. This category of considerations is focused on human behavior, factors impacting fundamental human needs, our unique character and purpose. When you look across these um, categories of information, you can see things like um, human experience and holistic ergonomics. I'm gonna speak a little bit more to that one in just a moment. Um, the social network perspective, acknowledging that people join networks simultaneously as an individual, a member of a group and a participant in a broader community. Looking at things like psychological safety and fundamental human needs, 
and a range of characteristics, you know, that every individual group and community um, can use to describe themselves, not only in terms of where they've been, but also where they want to be in the future and how to create a plan to use design to um, achieve that, that state. One of the things that I want to mention on the social network perspective, so this is um, an example of some exciting new work that we have in development in collaboration with sociologist Dr. Andreas Hofbauer. And um, it's rooted in the premise that social networks are more than pipes through which ideas and behaviors flow. They are also filters that determine what ideas can reach us and how we interpret them. So we're working with Dr. Hofbauer to find ways to help um, organizations identify the shape of their network structures that exist within their organizations and how you can use that insight to create a, a, a matched pairing with the environment so that there's a good alignment between those things. So here's an example of uh, foundational insight from Noel. Holistic ergonomics, and really what we're talking about here is the blending of physical, mental, and social, um, social functions. Um, holistic ergonomics broadens the scope of engineering and cognitive ergonomics to include the social and collaborative context of our experiences within physical environments. It leads to healthy and productive solutions at both the macro scale or the overall planning and layout of a, a place and the micro scale or the immediate environment within arm's reach of a person. So now let's take a look at the next principle, places that matter strengthen broader communities. Our activities inherently connect us to other people and ideas, both directly as, with, as in, excuse me, as in the case with teammates working together on a project and indirectly like an artist, a hobbyist, or a professional practicing a craft on their own. Places that strengthen, <clears throat> places that matter strengthen our relationships through the ability, through their ability to support what we do. Whether we're residents of a building, caregivers within a hospital, students within a school, or employees within a workplace. One of the things that I do on the side is um, I'm a, a textile designer and a weaver, and I've got a space here in my home that I use for that craft. And when I engage in that work, it allows me to connect with weavers all over the world that are engaging in a similar activity. If that space doesn't support me well and allow me to engage in that activity in a really fluid way, you better believe that that impacts my feelings of connections to that broader community. The way that we design any place has that same impact. So the way that it supports activity is really important. Um, an interesting side note here is that our original research that informed the development of the Aeron chair taught us that an environment can strengthen the resolve or improve the abilities of people and that many people will expand and strengthen their own abilities with help. So we view this to mean if you design your place in such a way to actually help people do what they seek to do, that they will take that on and use it to strengthen their own capabilities. So this category explores the broad range of people's activities and beyond simply identifying the function of work, it captures innovations and in work process and schedule as the value system of work and the tools used to complete it evolve. The word work in this context takes on an expanded meaning. Well beyond what we do seated at a desk in an office, work describes any activity that a person undertakes to generate value. It's not our job to define value. It's up to each individual to do that based on their own life. Our job is to help people as they seek to create value as they've defined it, whether that's preparing for a presentation to the board or preparing to host a flawless dinner party. Um, we can help with either of those aims. Another thing that is interesting within this category um, is it, earlier in the talk, spent a lot of time talking about um, working from home and um, hybrid work um, and those sorts of um, new dynamics that we're starting to see. Um, and this is a, a piece that arose from our work with Future Forum. One of the things that we're starting to see for organizations in supporting that type of activity is to develop team level working agreements. Um, this is a really great way to find um, ways to introduce some structure into this, um, this area of uncertainty that we're seeing in the work experience. Um, we can include a link after this uh, presentation as well, where you can find more information on that idea of team level working agreements. So here are some examples of recent insights from both Herman Miller and Noel for supporting both ends of the hybrid work spectrum. 
The Herman Miller uh, Work From Home Field Guide is a short and sweet guide that's produced in collaboration with GitLab, one of the world's largest all remote companies. And it's a quick and thoughtful summary of actionable steps that individual employees can take to improve their remote work experience. The meeting spaces to support hybrid work by Noel is a thorough report on planning and design considerations for creating spaces to connect remote and co-located participants. It includes several images of exemplary environments to serve as spatial thought starters for these types of interactions. The third principle, places that matter take on unique and desirable shapes, has two key aspects, unique and desirable. So unique means reflecting the specific character of people with design of places at individual, group, and community scales. And desirable means drawing from fundamentals of design and sensory engagement to make places inclusive, intuitive, and um, generally pleasing. So the expression of a place should be based upon the unique communities, cultures, and individuals for whom they have designed. Rather than asking people to conform to a uniform approach to place design, places that matter express what is authentic and aspirational for those who dwell within them. And the best way to realize this is to include people in the design process, bringing them along on the journey. We've been seeing for some time that the design process at leading firms is becoming much more participatory and dynamic in nature. And that means engaging end users directly in the design process and that the design work is ongoing, not a monolithic event. So we've even heard people say things that design begins at, on the day the facility opens. Um, this is something that we're seeing as being a, a, a significant challenge area where we need to look very closely at our budgeting and scheduling and even like contractual relationships to allow us to engage in a more dynamic flow of design so that we can respond to real conditions. So this category um, catalogs the practice of place design with special focus on the quality, quantity, and location of physical settings that compose a place. You can see some of the topics that um, we can dive into here from general conditions of surroundings within an environment, the settings that make up that broader environment, and even looking at the arrangement of furnishings and their articulation um, that form people's most intimate connection with that space. Looking at inclusive and participatory design as design approaches is something that's really key here, as well as um, this last topic that you see on the screen around neurodiversity and sensory engagement. This is an example of some exciting new work and development in collaboration with environmental psychologist Dr. Sally Augustine, and it's built on the premise that no person is average. We all bring something unique to our perceptions, and there's a lot of buzz in the industry presently around designing for neurodiversity, and this is a very good thing. Um, but we see this as something a bit broader in terms of just broader differences in sensory perception, um, including the neurodiverse spectrum, but also well beyond that, looking at things like vision impairment, hearing impairment. So that's what's meant by this notion that no person's perspective is average. Here's an example of settings for the future of work by Herman Miller. Um, this is a, a tool that's really targeted at this idea of taking on unique and desirable shapes. The content here presents a broad range of applications configured for specific types of individual, group, and community level interactions. And again, we'll provide a link to this after the, after the session so that you can dive in in more detail. Finally, um, the last principle we're going to review today is that places that matter never stop improving. Places do not remain static. They either improve or diminish with age, and places that matter have the unique ability to get better over time. Their value may manifest in a variety of ways, ranging from emotional connections to a cherished lounge chair in a living room, to the dynamic nature of objects within an office that adapt to new teams and um, patterns of use. A place's ability to improve is largely determined by intentional and strategic investment in its creation. And one thing to note here, investment doesn't necessarily mean spending a lot of money on furniture, but it does mean carving out appropriate time to consider most important to consider what's most important to you and your organization or putting in place a plan to experiment and learn about new approaches to place design 
or quite simply making sure that you're right sizing the monetary spend for the value at hand. So this notion of intentional and strategic investment in the creation of place takes on many different dimensions. So this category documents methods for measurement and improvement of place value. As our expectations and activities become more fluid and personalized, so too must the places we create. And in turn, the methods we use to maintain and improve them over time will evolve as well. Um, this first piece on data capture, um, many organizations and de design firms alike are just beginning to grapple with place-based data. And one of the things that we're starting to see here is that you really need both qualitative and quantitative data together in order to form a complete picture and reveal meaningful insight about place design. So when I was mentioning earlier that premise that design begins on the day that the facility opens, this role of data is a key component of that, making sure that you're able to pull um, real-time insight from what's happening in the environment to inform design decisions on how to continuously evolve that place in an ongoing manner. Community management is another topic that has um, uh, seen a fair amount of airplay um, over the past few years, and this is something that we only expect to continue. And these are folks that really understand the intersections between people and their activities and the places that they use so that they can be um, kind of at the control board and pulling the levers to make adjustments as needed. We're also seeing a lot of development in the realm of um, designing for circularity uh, within finding ways to recapture um, objects in an environment after they've reached the end of their useful life to hold on to that value and make sure that we're not um, creating waste. So here are um, a couple examples of some very recent resources that were developed within this category, and these two go hand in hand. The Roundtable Recap documents recent peer-to-peer -peer roundtable discussions that were focused on sharing experiences with pilot spaces. It helps to inform the early stages of defining what hybrid means to an organization and how to approach pilot projects to test various solutions. Specific topics in that document include how to level the playing field and create seamless experiences for remote and on-site workers, and how to create destinations that will draw workers in, and finally, how to leverage co-working spaces to improve workplace accessibility for employees and reduce real estate costs for the organization. The second resource here, the Guide for Launching Successful Pilots, is a short but thorough guide on running, place, on running a place design pilot project. It's good for people who may have limited experience implementing pilots or want guidance on how to communicate the value um, the, of pilots to others in their organization. Um, it speaks directly to guidance on defining objectives as well as identifying how to measure the performance of the solution. Um, and it, yeah, that's, <laughs> oh my gosh, wow, you just saw me trip all over myself. <laughs> um, but the good news is uh, I tripped over the finish line. Um, so there's one last thing here. Um, this wraps up the broad introduction that I wanted to share on our emerging approach to place design as Miller Knoll. But to close, I'd like to share a video that we recently created. And I think that it sums all of this up as a beautiful invitation. So Mark, I'm gonna ask you if you can uh, roll that video. I would really appreciate it. This isn't just a chair. It's a statement, a family heirloom, a confidence boost. It's a sanctuary, a work of art, a seat at the table. And now our table has room for many. Miller Knoll is a one of a kind collective that celebrates our individualities and embraces our differences, all while uniting the most dynamic brands in design. Together, we have more opportunities to create, to scale, to deliver. We are all joined by a common purpose, design for the good of humankind. For over 100 years, our brands have been dedicated to not just improving spaces, but the world around us. Here, design is a verb. Everything is an action of intention. Solving problems through innovation, providing people with comfort and support, promoting sustainable practices, and building a brighter tomorrow. Because we live the future we design. Together, we have the expertise, range, and diversity 
to help our customers design the spaces they envision. At Miller Knoll, we have the power and the responsibility to spark positive change, make a true difference, and design a more beautiful world. We believe that everyone has something to bring to the table. So pull up a seat and let's get started. Great. Well, thank you very much, Joseph. A great session. I have a few questions for you. And great. Hopefully you're, you're ready for them. Thank you yes. very much. One question. Uh, when you use the term knowledge workers, what do you mean? Could you clarify that, please? Yes, for sure. So that's, um, you know, what we thought of as someone who traditionally has sat at a desk. These are not folks and uh, that are, you know, working on factory floors that are, um, uh, reliant on specific equipment uh, to do their job. These are folks that are really working with um, text, with software, um, very lightweight. And I want to acknowledge that when you look at the working population of the world, this is a small subset. Um, our conversation on this is a bit imbalanced. Um, a lot of work is happening um, to focus on the other workers that are critically important for keeping all of this going. Um, I know that with Miller Knoll in particular, if it weren't for the folks working in all of our factories, working hard to keep things going throughout the pandemic, we would not be sitting here today. And the partnership that I mentioned with Future Forum um, is kicking off a series of working groups that actually started this week. Um, and two of the cohorts within that are focused specifically on what Boston Consulting Group is calling the deskless worker. So this is something where we're taking a much more holistic view um, of the broader working population. But when I said knowledge worker in the context of this presentation, these are folks that have the ability to work on laptops and have a lot more freedom than those that are on a, a, a factory floor. Thank you. And in answer to many of the questions, we will be following up with links to all the research and details that, that Joseph has mentioned. Uh, and uh, there will be a recording. And, and, and if for those that couldn't see the video, and there was a couple of people who couldn't, we will make sure that's in the recording that we'll be sharing on our YouTube channel. Joseph, would continuous improvement be considered as a final stage in the design agreement? Future proofing as part of the design decision. Um, I yeah. Sorry, carry on. Again. <laughs> there is a little bit more, but carry on. Um, I love that idea. If that was, if that would be part of the agreement, I do have to say though, I have a bit of a pet peeve on the the phrase future proofing. Um, when you think of what it means to proof something, whether you're waterproofing, rust proofing, it's all about resisting that element. So I really don't like the idea of resisting the future. Um, so in, in essence, designing so that you um, aren't embracing that change. Moreover, I really like the idea of embracing change and having more of a fluid relationship with that. So this notion of continuous design is I, I get the point of what's behind that statement of future proofing, but I think we really mean something else, the ability to navigate seamlessly. And if we can find ways to write continuous improvement into the agreements of the working relationships between designers, suppliers, real estate organizations, that's the future that we need to figure out how to build from like a, a financial structure standpoint. Thank you. Um Someone's asking, could you clarify a little bit more about the uh, social networks that you mentioned, Andreas Hoffbauer, and could you talk yeah, a little bit sure. about Yeah, for sure. So one of the things that um, uh, Dr. Hoffbauer has shared with us is when you think about, and just to be clear, when I say so social networks, I'm not talking about Twitter or Facebook or any of that. This is about the actual structure that the social organization takes within your organization. And one of the things that Dr. Hoffbauer shared with us is you can imagine those shapes as either looking like fishing nets where there's no clearly defined center or more like a firework where there's a clear center that with lines that radiate out. Those are just a couple examples of the different structures or different shapes that networks can create and information moves throughout those networks in different ways. 
So it's important to be able to identify the shape of your network so that you can understand how knowledge and information is going to move through it so that you can design solutions to enable that fluidity. Um, this is something that is, I, I would say, very much on the leading edge of looking at um, org design and how place design responds. Um, so that's um, something that we're diving into that I'm really excited about. Thank you. And, and Andreas Hafbauer does have a video which you might want to watch, and it's on our YouTube channel. So do go and check that out. Um, Mark says, shouldn't we coin the term manage and maintain? And in fact, I, I heard another term the other day, which I love actually measure and manage. I guess it's a similar kind of thing, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and this is something that we're seeing start to take shape kind of organically. Um, it, it's quickly moving from the fringe to the center of the conversation. I think people are really realizing that that's um, a very important dynamic to have moving forward. You know, it's in a lot of conversations about the future of work, future of the office, or future of place design in general, these conversations tend to take this tone of like trying to imagine the shape of the box in the future that we're going to put people in. And I think that that's a little um, out of order. We should always be looking at what people are doing and the place should follow immediately behind. I think that over time, as we get better and better at this, the gap between people and place will get smaller and smaller. So we'll have a much stronger fit or a much more purposeful fit between the two, but the place should always come after the people in my view. So when we measure, we're finding out what the movements of people are going to be um, and make sure that the place is there to come behind them as a support. So you're putting people in front. Yeah, I, I love the, the the Neil Usher's quote in the book, which I quote often, which workplace should be in beta mode, but it can only be in beta mode if you're measuring it and managing it, of course. Yeah. It's no good thinking it's not right and then doing nothing about it, of course. Yeah, and that's like the dynamic of, of the organization and what they're paying attention to. But the thing that I love about this is that in general, people are really starting to understand their personal relationship with environments and how um you know this is something that is is really personal a, an ideal configuration for one person might be really detrimental to someone else and all of the study that we're doing through environmental psychology and neuroscience is helping us to understand those wiring diagrams to figure out what sort of stimuli is helpful for one person um, versus another and so when you start linking that knowledge up at the organization level you can use that information um uh, to really provide the best possible support. So when you think of it like in the operations function of a business that's looking at logistics and all sorts of things around the flow of, of the business, all sorts of insight is targeted on that to make sure that those operations and systems are running optimally. And we're starting to see that level of um, intention being applied at the place design level, as opposed to something that's just like a default. Thank you. Great question from Jeff here. Previous Herman Miller research has led us to living office. How relevant do you find living office today? And how is the new research evolving the original living office finding? Uh, great question. Um, this, what I've shared today, um, supplements does not supplant. So living office is embedded within this as well as thriving workplace on the null side um, i've just completed a very in-depth review of both of those um, bodies of thought to find the places where they they align perfectly and there are some where we have been saying exactly the same thing with slightly different languages and then there are other places where one organization saw something that the other didn't and so there's this more I would say fully formed foundation. So the those that were familiar with living office, all of that is embedded within this. And I mentioned, I think a, a couple times, fundamental human needs, characteristics, uh, activities, settings, like all of that is built upon this. And so basically um, when that, that thought or that thinking was launched, the word living was um, included as part of the title intentionally because it was always intended to evolve and grow. And where we're at today is part of that natural evolution and growth, supercharged by the addition of the insight and legacy of Knoll and the Knoll planning unit and the research that they've brought. So that mention that I made of 
null thinking about planning as looking at the holistic environment and kind of scaling down to the, the person and Herman Miller looking at the person and scaling up to the holistic environment. That's that kind of um, more complete, fully formed, stronger picture, that um, combining of the sine waves graphic that I shared early on. Thank you. And a quote I use often, I heard when I first came to Herman Miller, actually, was the past can be an anchor or a sail. And I do like that, that actually we do, even looking back at the, the, the Knoll research in 1943 uh, with uh, Probst in 1960s and even the living office, it's not that it's, it's dead, it's, it, it is evolving. And I, I do like that, that we use it as a cell to drive us forward. So thank you very much for that. Hey, I've um, got to say one thing on that point, um, because I, I spend a lot of time going through our research and I can reach over here to my bookshelf and pull some things out. And they, there's one report in particular from 2014 that I love. It's just an amazing body of research. I can't tell you how many times I've had people come back and say, that's old, show me the new stuff. And it drives me crazy when I hear that because like really good research about fundamentals of the human condition doesn't really age, you know? It's like, so you find those things that are those golden nuggets and you carry those along with you. Some things do evolve, that's true, but what I've shared today is um, this kind of synthesis and pulling all of those, those uh, I would say persistent insights to the forefront and making sure that we're not leaving them by the wayside, but continuing to build on them. There are so many things that we know about how to make great places right now that organizations aren't acting on, regardless of whether or not we add new information to that pile. There's a tremendous amount of positive benefit that can be gained based on what is already known. Yeah, that fundamental human research, we're still fundamental humans, you know, we've not changed or morphed into anything else. So, Josie, if you're going to earn your money now, okay, because I love this question from Tricia, are you ready for this? Do you have sure. any insights into the type of features which will now attract people back to the office? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say what kind of people um, and it really comes down to understanding your audience. And this applies with any any premise, anytime you're creating a product and I'm, I'm leveraging my my um, coworker and work team leader here, Ryan Anderson, and saying, you've got to take a marketer's mindset here. What does your audience want? What do they need and create a product that's desirable to them? Um, I can say that generally people are wanting places to connect socially. So I think that the days of walking into an office and just seeing an endless wide open area of desks and chairs, that's not it for most people. What you are going to want to see is something that's an inviting environment that someone can see their needs being reflected within that. And so that means a broad range. When you go into one of those open community type settings, you're gonna to wanna to see places for the introverts and the extroverts and everyone on the spectrum in between. So that means somewhere that someone can post up and see and be seen right by the front door, along with little places along the fringe where folks can kind of tuck off on the edge and kind of assess what's happening and emerge as they feel more comfortable. But you wanna create places for both of those types of individuals to come together. And that's how you start to knit back together the social fabric of the organization. So I would say generally creating an environment that allows multiple different types of people from different perspectives to feel comfortable and allow them to cultivate different states of mind, whether that's being very open and social or finding places where you can kind of retreat to find more focus. And that's coming from our understanding from the Home Life Evolution uh, Research Project that I mentioned earlier on in that um, a lot of people have been able to find um, productivity and focus in working from home, but a lot haven't. It's like almost a 50-50 split. Um, so creating places that either allow people to escape the monotony of their home life or the chaos of their home life, both are there. So it's not um, a, a universal thing. My best suggestion for you, if you're in a position of creating places, is to talk to your people. And that point on on data that I mentioned in that last selection on uh, section on um, uh, improving places, the qualitative and quantitative assessment, finding survey mechanisms that you can deploy on a regular basis, 
and making sure that you're deploying them in a way that you're only asking for as much information as you're prepared to act on. Because if you send out a huge survey and it takes a long time and you only act on a small percentage of it, that information, the next time you send out a survey, you're only going to get a small percentage of people that respond. So this is building new muscle memory of dialogue between people and their expectations and creating or reflecting those expectations in the environment you create. Joseph, I want to say thank you very much for a great session, really informative. Thank you very much for uh, sharing. And I can't believe we've not, we've not had you on the Insight series before, but thank you very much for joining us. Very happy to do.